Okay, any sec. Hey, <laughs> well, members of the Astronomy Club and the rest of you stargazers that we're going to get in the club uh, once again. It's time for our special weekly vlog every Monday morning, at eleven to noon. We call it the SBAU Astro Hour on behalf of the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit, South Central Coast of California's longtime astrophysics and telescope club based at the beautiful Santa Barbara <clears throat> pardon me, Museum of Natural History, where SBAU holds our first Friday of the month general meetings, preceded by a half-hour free show in the planetarium. And boy, did we have a meeting last Friday night. Wish you were there. <laughs> Hosting the very popular outdoor star parties <clears throat> coming up on the second Saturday this next weekend, starting at dark right next to the museum's Palmer Observatory, and if you're interested in astronomy, come join us. Check us out on sbau.org. Watch us live here Monday mornings, like we're about to have some fun and learn a lot of stuff. Watch on YouTube, where you can connect or comment and ask your questions. We cover it all, anything out there, even here on Earth. I'm your host, Ron Heron, the Vice President. Stand by to meet the rest of the Astronomical Unit Board. Uh, this week, we're going to talk about the big anniversary. We just passed one, 100 years since we learned about the Hubble constant. And we'll talk about that. It happened in a mountain in Southern California. The moon has just passed through its last quarter. And it makes it a little uh, nicer to watch earlier in the evening. So it rises late. We're going to check out Orion's belt, all three of those stars. Guess what the web found? 42 rogue planets, big Jupiters that are not orbiting stars. They're on the rogue, uh, they're roving around each other. They are orbiting. And uh, check out Cassiopeia, Queen of the Evening. Comet Hartley is about to reach perihelion around the sun. And the ghost of Saturn, this is all something new for me, just in time for um, Halloween. Yet another asteroid visit, this time for Psyche, hitting Psyche, the asteroid. Let's meet the gang. Jerry Wilson, beloved president. Hello again, sir. Good morning. You actually did Friday night something I thought about doing, except that it had been a hot day, and that was getting my beautiful SBAU jersey jacket out with the logo on it. You took it. You weren't wearing it when I saw you, but I, I should probably do the same thing. We should all wear our jackets. Certainly, I live in the damn things over winter. <laughs> Anyway, Jerry, how's your wife, Pat Forgey? Everything's good. Okay, and he's running the show here, temporary, <laughs> uh, I guess, webmaster. Let's meet our outreach coordinator, Chuck McPartland. What Morning. What awesome gentleman there who's married to the merchandise manager, Pat McPartland. And they, I guess she's okay now, and the, you guys do a lot of extra work, and we're going through some changes. We're going to have a election to confirm possible new board members in in coming two months, December. Who else is on screen? Well, doggone if Bruce Murdoch didn't join us, longtime supporter, telescope enthusiast, married to Bonnie, and also he's president of the Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. Real quickly, Bruce, anything going on? No, uh, we don't get to know uh, whether or not uh, Saturday is available until the preceding Tuesday. That's oh. tomorrow. Does anybody so we... go Anybody go over to Arlington and clean those pipes? They don't get dusty, do they? And worn old. Uh, dust doesn't make that much difference. Plus, the <laughs> air going through them. No, there's you know, there's 25 horsepower motor driving a four stage axle wind compressor. You know, there's a fair amount of air that's moving around. <laughs> but well, look, uh, we'll be there. Let us know. Tom Whittemore is online, editor of the Morning. newsletter. How are you, Tom? And he's Fine. married to Maureen, yeah. former science instructor at Westmont College. And we're joined by uh, Tim Crawford, who is a resident lens and telescope expert, married to Karen, longtime SBAU member, co-founder of, I guess, the co-founder of our Telescope Tuesday Wednesdays. Tuesday, no. Workshop. It's the word, uh, not Wednesday. Just Tuesday night. That's still going on, but you're not there as often as President Jerry, are you? It'll be tomorrow night. No, I am. I'm, I'm oh. there. I, I'm, I missed a few, but I'm there. How many faces on the screen do you guys get, Jerry? Oh, boy. Uh, we get about six. Yeah. That, that isn't like the group we have on the screen right now. Or the SBAU Astro Hour. We always start with a little levity. Gets us in a very light mood because President Wilson. God, I kind of feel awesome saying that. Uh, forwards these silly science cartoons to us, and let's see if we can match them up. Oh, here <laughs> we go. Like this one, yeah. 
Uh, this would be the, uh, I, I wrote something down about it. No, I can't even find it. Uh, equator, boat on the line. A lot of folks don't realize there's a line out there. Also goes across uh, tropical jungles. <laughs> And everything is different as far as the rotation of your hurricanes north and south. Does Australia get monsoons or hurricane? Sure. And and they're in the opposite direction, aren't they? Yeah, Coriolis is up is the other way Cor down there. Coriolis effect. Yeah, I realize that. That's a great uh, picture. Kind of runs into it. It's like killing a whale when you run across that. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Niels Bohr said this, an expert, you know, is a person who has made all the mistakes that can be made in a very narrow field. <laughs> it's so deep. God bless. Thank you for those. Now, the half glass of water, different interpretations. We have the optimist, half full. We have the pessimist, half empty. A realist says it's just a glass of water for crying out loud. Your physicist measures liquid versus gas. Surrealist has it up and down in the middle. Half empty for the relativist. Okay. Uh, the utopist. What does that mean? It's in the top. Everything's wonderful, right? With the utopist. Yeah. Everything's wonderful. But a skepticist puts it at the bottom. The artist has a paintbrush. Well, in the, art, the, the skepticist <laughs> says it's not water. <laughs> oh, it's not even water. Yeah. <laughs> Skeptics. Okay. The only one that's missing would be an alcoholic. Yeah. What I want to have anything to do with. And here we go. We've been kicking this around. How many hydrogen atoms are in a single molecule of water as opposed to the number of stars in the entire solar system? Bruce? You <laughs> <laughs> I got tricked by this one. Yes, that's a true statement. <laughs> okay. I, of all it, people that answered you, it was me. I figured it. It took me a while there because you tend to want it to did say, me too. I fell in the same trap Bruce did, but I didn't do it over email. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. It's the word entire. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there's only one star in our solar system. Here's Sir right. Isaac Newton's cat, which is as much a hero and a jerk as the one that uh, Chuck the jerk, yeah. <laughs> forgotten hero. It's about to knock the damn apple onto his head. And he's the first one in history to actually, oh, here we go, on top of his doghouse, Snoopy in the Peanuts cartoon says, you know, all of us get lost in the darkness. Dreamers learn to steer by the stars. Oh, my God, that is so deep. Going to have a show about that on December, one of our members giving us how to navigate. Okay, two guys are coming in close to the sun at the... Um, <laughs> More, uh, they're running the machine there. They're inside the spaceship. No good, Dawson. We're being sucked into the sun by the gravitational field, and there's nothing we can do. And by the way, those damn sunglasses you're wearing, they're mine. Give them to me for crying out loud. Air conditioning, guys. <laughs> oh, here we go. I like this one. This would be the par parallel versus perpendicular universes. There's the parallel upside down or however it's angular. And there's a perpendicular. Whoops. Leave that one back on, Jerry. Oh, oh the perpendicular one? Well, I was wondering where are the angular one or the unireverse. Oh. <laughs> but that's all right. We get some deep stuff. And it gets us in a light mood. I don't know where you want to start. Maybe if you do with your talking points astronomy's big debate in fact uh friday night i was given the card of a guy who's an expert on mount wilson and he i guess he lives down there and he may be one of our speakers next year concerning this very topic the big debate of exactly a hundred years ago actually it was in the 20s right 19, 100 years ago yeah 1923 yeah okay but october 6 23 is when edwin hummel sat down at the mount wilson Big, uh, light, a big, uh, what oh, it's an inside in those days, they didn't have computers, did they? He looked through the back end of no, he was he was doing on photographic plates, Ron, not not visual. Oh, really? They didn't look through yeah. a through the back end of a big you know, no, okay. no. And here is the legendary plate the, the words VAR stands for what variable, variable, and he crossed out of a he used he the blank out that's a shot of us andromeda right yes this is a negative image of andromeda okay 
which they thought um, was just and right here there's there's two lines and right between the two lines right there is a star that he's marked with a v or an n can't yeah. tell he was marking what he thought were novas you know where yeah. there was a star that brightened up relative to a previous plate that he was comparing it to hmm. and then he realized for the one up top that not only was it did it get brighter but it also got dimmer so it sometimes it was there and sometimes it wasn't which made it a variable star which was very important yeah because and up here star. is two other lines and this one see he's crossed out just as chuck said he's crossed out nova and he's written in variable Okay, but understand and make us understand. Why does that make another you another? Um, you, I keep wanting to talk like like Bruce did, the uh, solar system, another galaxy rather than everybody just thought it was uh, one of the nebulas. And well, recently, Oklahoma. having recently been sort of discovered or at least uh, elucidated, was the idea that there are these Cepheid variable stars that have a regular period depending on their absolute brightness. So if you measure the period of their variation, you know their absolute brightness and you can therefore get a distance to them. And they were they could be used as what are called standard candles. And the fact that this was a variable, he didn't know at first it was a Cepheid, but it turns out it was. And so if you measure the period of its variation, then you know its distance. And now he can find the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, Tom, you want to Tom Whittemore? You gave a speech on Cepheid variables once before the club. You want to add anything to that? No, no. Chuck, Chuck has it right. So. Well, I don't. I still don't understand. Doesn't the same thing you just described happen with the Cepheid variables in our galaxy? Why would that yes. make it? Yeah. Yes, but you can measure their distance because of that. So the Cepheid variables in our galaxy, you get small distances. The Cepheid variable in the Andromeda galaxy, you get a huge distance. But you also get a double check on the ones in our galaxy because you can use parallax to determine how far away they are also. Yeah. Yeah, well, parallax wouldn't work on this, but the no. fluctuations, the timing, it, it makes it a farther distance. I don't understand no, that. Um, the let, me, timing. let me make a comment yeah. that might help the Baron. When you look at the, just like Chuck said, when you look at the Cepheid variable, you can determine, you can see how, how fast it oscillates. And when you do that, once you get that, then you can tell how bright the star is at the star. And then you see how bright the star is from here. And you compare the two with the inverse square law, and that's how you get the distance. By how bright it appears, you know, you know, you know how bright it absolutely gets from right. the variation. And by how bright it appears, you now have its distance. Right. Can I make a comment too? Is sure. it when I heard about standard candles, the, the explanation I heard that was really nice, I don't know if it applies here, but it was like the head, the, the car lights. You, you know what car lights look like. And if you see a car light up in the mountains, you can see how small it looks and dim. But yet if the car light is coming right down the street, it's really, really bright and rather large. But it's, it's that idea of the standard candle. It's still a car light. And I don't know if it applies in, in this instance, but uh, that's what, how I understood standard candles. I don't know how that applies to Cepheids, though. Yeah, that, that applies. It's it's the you know that the brightness goes down as one over r squared, and so if you know the absolute brightness and you know the apparent brightness, you can figure out the distance. Take the okay. square root of the ratio. Yeah. yeah, but this isn't the same event that gave us the Hubble constant. This isn't when no. he realized everything. No, that's a the Hubble constant's a different different so thing named for the same guy. This yeah, is know, something that Hubble did. The other one is something that was named after him. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see. And it was discovered later in nineteen. And, and it's called the Hubble parameter these days because it apparently is not a constant. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, where, where I'm lost in this in this image, is it? I guess I'm looking at the letters N, and those yeah. are the kids. Those are novas. He was looking for things that change brightness. Okay. And and those were new stars that had appeared relative to another image. Okay. But then on the one up top, he realized, oh, it was coming and going. 
Well, like the Milky Way uh, and all galaxies, the Andromeda is turning and therefore half of it is where well, the stars are going away from us and would give us the red uh, shift, right? The infrared. The others... Is well, not infrared, learned? not at that distance. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, this still, one... I'm, yeah, this okay. is not the, the time okay. scale of the galaxy rotating is um, not, not relevant here. Um, oh, it has nothing to do with it. Okay. This would be an idea of the galaxy rotating time frame. Wow. I don't recall so, seeing the dinosaur in the picture. Takes 225 million years for the galaxy to rotate once. Oh, wow. And uh, so the there's nothing going on on October 6, 1923, that would indicate rotation of the galaxy. Okay. There would be red shifts if he had looked at, and blue shifts slightly if he'd looked at it spectroscopically. But what he did, um, let me get. And the really, the really accurate spectroscopy happened later than this. Yeah. So what he did was, just as Chuck said, uh, he marked, he's looking for new stars. And so he took a, a whole series of pictures of Andromeda, or he obtained them, whether he took them personally or not, I don't know. But on each of on this plate, he marked the, the stars that were new that didn't appear on any previous plate. So he, these were new stars. And he picked this one as a new star. Then he went back and looked at the other plates and he said, well, this is sometimes there and sometimes not there. So it's not a new star, it's a variable star. And he measured the time period of the variable, the pulsation. And he looked it up on, on the correlation that had been discovered earlier for Cepheid variables that were very close to us, where we had a parallax measurement of how far away these stars actually were. And, and so he looked up the period on this chart, and then that gave him uh, the absolute magnitude of the star at the star. And then he calculated how bright the star appeared here, and he knew how bright the star was if we were right up next to it. And from the difference, he figured out how far away it was. And that proved that the Andromeda was a galaxy, another galaxy like ours. It was not a spiral nebula in our galaxy as had been proposed. So it, and they used to refer to our galaxy as an island universe, meaning that they thought it was the whole shebang. Right. And they thought this was a nebula. Right. Andromeda. And, and as, I, re as yeah. I recall, he was fairly accurate. I mean, it wasn't no. a, a good distance, but he was fairly accurate. Well, no, he was off. No. He was he off had, by he had five hundred thousand light years for it. Um, he wasn't accounting for dust and attenuation, and they also hadn't calibrated Cepheids perfectly because they had mixed up Cepheids with another class of variable stars that occurred in globular clusters that um, also varied. Uh, relative to their brightness, but with a different relationship. Right. And so his number wasn't really super great, but it was enough that it was, you know, you could tell it was a, a huge right. distance away. Right. Those stars, Chuck, remember, are called RR Lirays. Yeah, there we go. R Lirays. Okay. R -R. Yeah. RR, double R. R, two R's. How the hell do you see a star in another, uh, or another, you know, galaxy? It's, it's Big it's telescope. Yeah, 100-inch 100 100 telescope. That was the key. Can you or my new one. It does it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I a scope on a tall mountain, so you don't have the, the distortion okay. of our atmosphere. I think we're back here at home, aren't we? Night sky coming on, ladies and gentlemen. Warp this speed. Is, this is the west, western sky, about two hours or an hour after sunset. Now, I have a bone to pick with this. This is typical uh -oh. of, of Astronomy Magazine. This is, if you're at upstate New York, maybe you have a chance of seeing this Hickson group at this time of year now. But and that's where they no are. Attitude, this is so low and so much in the atmospheric extinction and the brightness of sunset that it's hopeless to try for this. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, it is it, from my it, house because I've got mountains in the way. Yeah. Yeah. Hickson group galaxies are yeah. really tough. They're really tough. They have... Yeah. Um, similar red shifts and so they seem to be traveling together and for next saturday star party we have trees all around our star party location you won't see this next saturday on our telescopes <laughs> not easily it's also very faint it's such a, it's a real challenge 
it's in there because a astronomy magazine is on the east coast in new york and b um this the moon is now uh it's just past last quarter so the early evening sky is all of a sudden not not um rich in moonlight that scatters so in principle at a dark site you could see the hickson 68 uh hickson had a a 100 items in his catalog of faint associations of galaxies and even so that would have been a lot better last month or the month before you know just yep yeah message got well, message the received the doesn't uh wiggle it all over the place so this isn't a star cluster. These are actual galaxies. It's called the Hickson yeah. Compact Galaxy. It's a cluster galaxy. of galaxies. Yeah, it's a Hickson group. Okay. <clears throat> and the um, the uh, and it also takes a big telescope. The um, let's see the the obviously with those magnitudes. Yeah, yeah, these are the the they're about eleven and a half magnitude, and That's so. You're not going to be able to see them. Um, you need to be somewhere in a large telescope, 10 to 12, even though in principle, under a very dark sky, the limiting visual magnitude for a six inch is 13.4 magnitude. Uh, more realistically, it's probably about 12 or something. Yeah. Every magnitude is a brightness change of two and a half. Yeah. Uh, eight and, inch and diameter, you get up to 14. 10 inch diameter, you get up to 14 and a half. 12 and a half, my most used telescope is magnitude 15. And then 16, you get up to 15 and a half. You would need about a 20 or 24 to get up to, to break the 16 magnitude barrier. Yeah. And, and also you have what's called atmospheric extinction. So when you're looking at them low, you're looking through more air and at yes. that level, you'd lose about another magnitude of brightness. Right. So this is when you're looking pretty much straight up as Chuck points out. But are these galaxies all tied together like our local group that we're in? Sometimes, yes. Sometimes not. Okay. This is the Hickson group. This one is included. They all have similar redshifts. They're all about the same distance away. There's another galaxy down there that's probably not part of the group. There's a little galaxy there. Do they have name, individual names for the galaxies? NGC they'll have catalog numbers. numbers. Yeah. I, what did you say, Ch Chuck? They'll have catalog numbers, like Jerry yeah. said. Oh, but not MSDA numbers. He didn't see it. No. Any. Oh, no, no, no. Much too dim. Okay. Wow. Okay. The Hicks, who's the guy named Hickson? Do you know who he was and when he, he existed? Other well, than this catalog, a, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, is it NGC 5353? Is that what all of this Yeah, that's are? one of them. Oh, that's just one of the galaxies. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And there's 68. That's the Big Dipper right there. I mean, uh, Orion, what am I saying? Yeah, this is Orion. <clears throat> all right, we're back up there. Web so this is, this is coming into the sky now. This is in the morning. This is in the east. It's a strong winter constellation. This is 4 a.m., and you don't see the horizon down here anywhere. So it's um, on this planetarium chart. So it's starting to get up in the sky. It'll be very dramatic in about three or four months now in the evening sky. <clears throat> but this is uh, focusing on the magazine focused on the belt, which apparently was disappointing to Orion because he only gave it three stars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> huh. And is this when it happened to stumble across the, uh, what is it, 43, 63, the, the rogue planets? 42 of them. We'll get to those. That's a separate story, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is that looking at the night sky, I go to bed quite late, and I'll go out, I look at the night sky, and very often, at least here, it's humid, and there's water all, you know, there's condensation, dew all over the place. Yeah, like the last night. The transparency is very, very good. But the uh, twinkling, you know, the, the uh, scintillation is very, very pronounced. Hmm. Have, you yeah, the, have, you the hydrogen, have you counted the hydrogen atoms in those uh, molecules? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 
Actually, my calculator carries 48 digits, so I should be able to do it. <laughs> okay, so this is the winter constellation. We see it better. It goes higher. In the winter. And the winter, more has more bright, the winter has more bright stars than the summer does, yeah. despite the summer triangle. Yeah, this whole area around Orion in the in the winter circle, it's called of stars. It's the biggest assortment of bright stars you get all year round. Yeah. Well, so so the it is. is. Summer triangle is still visible in the west. Low in the west. What's low in the west? The summer triangle. Oh, well, yeah. Summer triangle is almost overhead still right now at nine o'clock. Well, it depends what time you're looking. I'm talking yeah. about looking at 2 a.m. Yeah, yeah. Well, does Australia get Orion in the summer? Yep. Yes. Uh, in the winter. In their, in their summer. summer. In their summer, though. Yeah. And it looks upside down. So you see where there's the belt and the sword, and the sword is, you know, down to the Orion Nebula in M43. If you turn that upside down, they call it the saucepan. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, different cultures of the world have different names and constellations. This is the hunter, and that would be what Grecian in origin. What did the Arabs call it? That what was Sumerian, I think. Yeah. Oh, it's Sumerian. Uh, what other things have been put on those three stars? You suppose? Oh, in all America? all over the world, all kinds of things. Wow. So this is the belt again here, and this shows the Horsehead Nebula. Yeah. And the flame nebula. Yeah. Now that's another bone I have to pick with this. Just, you know, <laughs> they, the narrative that went along with this said, oh, turn your scope on the horse head nebula. What do you see? And it's like, unless you have like a 14 inch scope with no dust on it, you don't see nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I have <laughs> taken pictures of those with my 11 inch. Pictures are easy. Pictures target. are easy, but oh, visually, yeah. forget about it. Well, Charles does bring a 20-inch scope to some yeah. reaches. Yeah. And if you have a hydrogen beta filter, yeah, you, you'll see something that looks like a big thumbprint. But but the narrative was kind of implying like, oh, go crank your scope on this. You know, it's, <laughs> it's pretty tough. It, it, Joe, yeah. Several times Joe had his 18 and, and with the H beta filter. And yeah. boy, it was really tough. And that was from the gun club. Yeah. But it's it's easy it's easy photographically, but but visually it's it's kind of tough. You use a lot of a, a good imagination works. Yeah. <laughs> so memorize this chart. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and down here is the Great Nebula in Orion, one of the brightest nebulas in our sky. And uh, the Running Man over here. Oh, it's wow. interesting the color contrast there compared to the horse head, you know. This this is not a photograph. Okay. This okay. is a computer, a planetarium generated graphic. Okay, so they use different photographs to put up those images. I would yeah. guess, yes. Well, Jerry, where's the running man in there? Running man? Yeah. Right where the, the hand is. Oh, okay. Right huh. I gotta go after that. It's Actually. fairly faint and visually. Yeah. Okay. It's easier than the horse head, though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and the flame nebula is quite nice. Yeah. It's often of called the tank, tank track nebula. The tank tracks? Oh, I see. Yeah. Do you yeah, need the, horse, a the horse head nebula is this dark nebula, not the red nebula. Yeah. The it's red dark. nebula is the background. The horse head is the dark. Yeah. E.E. E. Barnard, e. Barnard called it uh, B33. Oh, yeah. he okay. was into dark nebula. Yeah. And that little red line kind of at the bottom of the horse's neck there, that is just an artifact of the planetarium program, putting in the lines for the constellation. Yeah, that's a continuation of this line. Yeah. But all the horse head nebula is, is a big bunch of gas blocking the view of the light, isn't it? That's, <laughs> that's it, yeah. Shaped like a horse's head. I'll never forget years ago at a star party, there was Chuck's uh, unit with a laptop and it was all this color, pink. And I said, I've never seen anything like that. Is that what you had on the screen when you look? No, up it was the Orion Nebula. Yeah, but that's what we're looking at, the red. No, no, no. Yep. The, the, uh, here's the Orion down Nebula there. down here. Yeah. Yep. What the, thought we were on the Orion Nebula right now. No, no. We're that's on a spot. Nebula in Orion. Oh. <laughs> Oh, I see. There. So you can see that. Now, 
Uh, hmm. Do we need a filter for the flame nebula? Or no, I mean a filter, a light pollution filter helps. Okay. Okay, trapezium. I thought trapezium. So the trapezium is a star cluster that that's centered in this nebula here. Four little stars. And this thing here is the Orion Nebula, M42. This little comma here is M43. Mm. Um, and I forget the name of this star here. Is that Sigma? And then no, no, no. But this picture was taken with a uh, film, not a digital, because this ring around a bright star like this is called a uh halation halo and it's light bouncing off the back layer of the glass plate and um for the star and coming up and it's dispersing slightly by the time it gets back to the emulsion on the face side and it produces a slight halo around it so you don't get this with uh, digital imaging huh. but we're still inside orion yeah yeah why, now, do this, suppose, why do you suppose back in Hubble's day they'd look at a negative? Did that negative we saw get turned into a positive with black background? They take the picture, as you know, all film things come from a negative. I know that. The do, they, do they ever make a positive? When the light hits the silver emulsion, it turns, it, uh, the silver uh, comes out of a, it becomes a, a elemental silver, and that's what makes the thing black. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's actually easier to see in the negative view than it is in the in the bright view, at least for me. It's easier yeah. to see detail. No, that's that's common. If you look back at um, if you read the Astrophysical Journal or the Astronomical Journal before digital imaging took over, you'd see that most of the scientific papers show their images in negative form because it's easier to pick out faint nebulosity on film in the negative than the positive. Plus, when you, make a, when you make a print, you probably lose a little bit of resolution. Right. Yes, you do. That's a good point. Well, does the well some of the pictures that I've taken of uh, comets, it's hard to see the two tails, but if I just do a control eye, I'd look at the inverse image, yeah. then you can see them easily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back in Hubble's day, did they? could you see the pink? Did they have color? Yeah. You could. Yeah, that's hydrogen. Oh, yeah. all, all color in... Um, Images is artificial color. Well, so, but what's the op? But it would be an opposite color on a, in a negative, wouldn't it? Yeah, they use black and white film. Uh, some of it had more sensitivity in the red, so nebulosity would come yeah. out. But they didn't. They didn't bother much with with trying to reproduce it as a color for your eye. Right. They didn't even see it, or they didn't know it, or no, no, they, they were They there. weren't. After they weren't after making pretty pictures like we are on our hobby. They were after scientific information. Ah, gotcha. Now this is, you can see the change from film. You can see the diffraction spikes around this star. And that tells us that this picture was taken by what telescope? James Webb. Yeah. Oh, is this a web? And this is just a feature that marks this one. It's a center mark somewhere. It got in in the processing. But this shows the trapezium in the center of the Milky Way or the Orion Nebula. This is M42, and off here is M43. And what they've which found ones would be the, which ones of those would be the E and F stars? There's <laughs> what, what? Yeah, they're showing quite large there. Yeah, right. it, it, it would, yeah. We don't see, we barely see the E and F stars in the trapezium every once These, in a while, but there's a million in there. Good grief. These pictures um, with the hub with the James Webb are in the infrared, so you may not recognize patterns. I've, when we first started taking pictures that, with in the infrared, we tested our cameras on the Orion Nebula, and they were it was very hard to spot features I knew or even the pattern of stars I knew. Stars are very different ratios of brightnesses to each other in the infrared, so oh. apparently. Um, the, um, let's see, oops, they found what in the trapezium, uh, they have found a number of stars that are Jupiter-like stars, or the planets, Jupiter. Planets. There were, 
What? <laughs> Planets. They'd be, they'd be brown dwarfs, wouldn't they? No, no, they're, they're jumbos. They're Jupiter yeah. mass uh, objects, but in binary systems. Yeah, Jupiter mass binary objects becomes jumbos. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they're called jumbos. They're <laughs> not they're not related to any star. They're apparently rogue stars, but they're, they're associated stars. with each other. They're not stars. We got to. They're not stars. Talking. They're not doing fusion, and right. they're not they're not brown dwarfs because they're not they're not that big. But they're gas giants like our Jupiter and the other four, and they're on their own out there in the middle space, not orbiting any stars at all. They're orbiting each other, though. So yeah. it's, it's implying they formed in eddies or they got some kind of three star interaction that tossed them, you know, that left them that way. But that's hard to do. So right. it's a question of how they formed. Well, talk yeah. about hard to do. It's difficult to see exoplanets either transiting or causing a star to wobble, let alone how in the world is it zero in on them going through dark space? Well, they, they emit infrared. They're, they're big and they're still emitting energy from their collapse. And so they're warm. But are there 42 in total or are they 22 rotating binaries or how does are they orbiting each other? All 42? I of think them? it's 42 binaries they found. Yeah. So that's a total of uh, 84 planets. Yeah. That are rogues. You know, there are rogue black holes too, I understand, but we'll never see those coming. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yeah, we could. If they swallow something. So oh. astronomers Samuel Pearson and Mark McCogren of the European Space Agency have coined the acronym Jupiter Mass Binary Object, or JUMBOs for short. Uh, they described that in their paper sent to um, Nature. The temperature, the jumbos are about a million years old. They have a temperature of about 1,000 degrees Kelvin, about 700 degrees Celsius. So they're not quite as warm as, or they're about the same temperature as Venus surface. Right. But they're guessing. So they, they are separated um, from each other in pairs between 25 and 390 astronomical units. Well, that's so huge. they're not tightly bound. An out spectral analysis of the faint life light they give off hints at water vapor, carbon monoxide, and methane. And Interesting. That, yeah. And that is so far normal for a baby gas giant star. The problem with jumbos is that they come in twos. Why that is, they have no idea. So the conclusion of this topic is that there is something fundamental that we're missing about planetary formation. Well, they, are they laid out there like a star cluster, only planets, or are they all in a row? So no, 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 no. They're just wandering around there. They're randomly distributed. Yeah. Just happen to be in the same area. Yeah. Well, well this is an intense star and planet formation region you see all that stuff there i mean yep. these infrared images emphasize the gas and dust so you got all kinds of formation going on the question is how do you form these large objects that are gravitationally bound because our models tend to show things forming individually you know so single objects that sort of sweep out their orbit instead of sharing a close orbit with something else <laughs> Well, if we didn't oh. have, if we were on a rogue planet Earth without the sun, we'd probably be orbiting Jupiter. So I'm imagining all of these rogues you're talking about, these jumbos probably are, have like little mini solar systems. It's, without it's not. It's not like we'd be orbiting Jupiter. No, it's it doesn't have enough gravitational effect on us at the speed we're moving. You don't think uh, so? No. Well, I'm just wondering if there's things orbiting these doubles, these it doubles. could well be, especially at some of those bigger separations. You could have lots of moons around each of those things. Hell, they probably have asteroid belts and Oort clouds and God knows what else, just no fusion. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be weird waking up and seeing about six moons in the sky? <laughs> Dark as hell. and But it's warm enough. Well, I say warm enough, not for life. But is our, are our gas planets that hot like you were talking about venus are they hotter than venus depends on the depth you're at okay but venus isn't a the one of the gas planets though i think yeah. we're, that's venus more like is hot for another there. reason yeah venus is a runaway greenhouse effect 
But obviously, uh, any other telescope but the web would never see these suckers, would they? None of ours. Big enough I aperture. Know. Yeah. <laughs> if they, they're emitting faint light, the thousand degrees Kelvin, um, we're at 370 degrees Kelvin. So um, they're hotter. So they probably emit their light in the mid wavelength region, three to five microns. Maybe you know, last, last week, Jerry, we were supposed to talk about a Magellan giant telescope being put together for erection down in Chile, and we never got around yeah. to it. Suppose something that big, if that's going to be the biggie of the world. No, this is, this is um, that will have a higher resolution, but it's primarily a visible range telescope. And the um, these things, their signatures were found and their spectra was recorded in the infrared. Mm. And our atmosphere messes with that. Yeah. But the scientists haven't come up with any theories about these rogues, these 42 jumbos that maybe they were tossed out of a, of a system. I'm sure that there's a, a number of people that are working very furiously on this. Trying to come up with how in the word they... Well, there's no reason the gas can't coalesce like our solar system did and just not spark, just stay dirt. <laughs> well, yeah, so if you don't have enough mass, you don't have fusion. So. Right. Yeah. I've always wondered about that. Why always a star? Okay. Not I, always a star. Don't assume it's always a star. Yeah. Yeah. In our, know, solar, this, in our solar system, 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 we didn't get ENF many star stars. Movie. Sorry, Tim, Jerry. Tim, what were you saying? Say it again. I think the ENF stars that we normally look for in the trapezium are on those two right stars that form that trapezium. One above the one on the upper right, and one below right. on the lower right. That one, no, the other, the other side. No, that's that's D. That's really? B. Yeah, Tim, the E star is the one that forms a little triangle on the right. So it's the, that's what I thought, right? Yeah, right. that's the yeah. E. Uh, the F and the G. Uh, the F, I think, is in the middle of this complex. I've I've seen the F before. Huh. And remember, That's Tim, this is infrared. So well, if you've got right. if you've got a really O or B star, like these trapezium stars tend to be, it's it's not necessarily going to look brighter in the infrared. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah they emit primarily uh, ultraviolet. We got four more topics to cover. You know, a Cassiopeia, the comet Hartley, mm -hmm. Ghost of Saturn, and another asteroid mission. We don't have to cover them all. <laughs> <laughs> We normally do somehow. You get it in in two minutes. Oh, we get close. Yeah. Okay, Tim, here's your star hop. All right. Four, five, seven. Oh, yes, yes. Queen of the evening. Cassie See Na yeah. Navi there in the middle of the W? And if yeah. you go up to the upper right left, there. far above to the upper left. Nope, nope. Go left, Jerry, to the to right there. there. Now, if you draw a line between that and Navi, it goes straight down, and then you make a right triangle to root uh, root bond. That's go go yeah. go from that star through Navi to NGC four five seven. That's what Tim right. said. Yeah, right. <laughs> and now that forms a right angle to the to the star to that left right there. That forms a right angle, and that's yeah. the the star hop. That's an easy star hop, and you hardly ever miss finding four five seven. Yeah, Tim, Tim. Yeah, I use the same star hop. So I basically look for a, a right triangle, okay, that's created by Navi and Rukba. Yep. And last week, uh, I had my F3.68 inch out at 24 power, three degree field of view, and the owl came in just glistening. <laughs> it's really pretty. Really yeah, pretty. just in, in the backyard here. Sometimes lower power on 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 uh, the owl is is just well, I'm, a lot yeah, better. I'm, yeah, I like star clusters a lot, open clusters a lot. So I tend to go low power anyway. Okay. Well, this is a good Halloween target. Yeah. Oh, it's it's absolutely four fifty seven is one of my favorites, and the little guy is upside down in my scope. <laughs> yeah. By the way, uh, Stellarium shows that uh, NGC four five seven as the dragonfly cluster. Yeah, you'll see it called that. You'll see it called the ET cluster. Oh, right. yeah, well, yeah, yeah. The yeah. F-18 on Afterburner. Uh -huh. <laughs> one one kid one night called it a bat ray. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You get that, but, you know, you literally tell the kids, because the kids, you know, during, 
during the the month of the ha Halloween. You, we show them this thing. It, they now I it. I was surprised by this drawing from someone. It's pretty yeah. good because, yeah. because I always picked this is tilted the other way. I always pictured this guy was here's his two eyes, and then here's his body with no spread wings, and here's his feet on the branch. Right. I see the wings left, right, Jerry. And there I, are I the wings too. I yeah, don't know those out. are is in the foreground. I don't think it belongs to that group. The but, eyes, yeah, the eyes are in the foreground. Yeah, they're actually two thousand light years away, and the rest of them are about eight thousand. Yeah, yeah, that's I all. We say ten thousand. So if we were on the other side, you'd see the back of his head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's only only about a hundred stars in that cluster. Yeah, it depends where you stop counting. Huh. Yeah. That's a really nice, cool nice there. red giants in there. Yeah. yeah. Depends how big your scope is. Yeah. <laughs> so the big W, the big lazy W of Cassiopeia is around that and out of the picture mostly, right? Yeah, it's huge oh, yeah. and out of the picture. And people okay. always they, they they always insist that they can see it. And yeah. you point, like, nope, nope. <laughs> you no, can't no. see it. <laughs> Not with your naked eye. No. In a dark spot, you might see one of the eye stars. That's maybe bright enough, but maybe, maybe, maybe. yeah. The only owl in it's not one of the eighty-eight constellations. It's not a constellation. It's an asterism. Not a constellation. It's no cluster. Asterism. The other owl, the uh, the nebula up in a Big Dipper owl nebula. Yeah, that's that's a planetary. Planetary. This one. Also has a number of unofficial names yeah. <laughs> that seem to be trying to tail uh, political correctness. Yeah. But uh, this is up there because Comet 103P Hartley, or also called Hartley 2, is passing right by this um, nebula on Chuck's favorite star chart. Ah. Oops, where did it go? I'm glad it's not oh. there. That's a horrible star chart. Damn. <laughs> Inbound to the yeah. sun. Yeah, right. I must have must have forgot to post it. <laughs> um, anyway, let's see. Let's get back to here. It's called uh, the Owl Cluster. No, yeah, oh, the Eskimo no. Nebula. NGC uh, four five seven is the universal name for the owl. But this, this is the yeah, this, this is, is the Eskimo or oh. the clown face. Or I I see in Jerry's narrative it was called the Lion Nebula. That's the current name in Astronomy Magazine is the exactly. Lion Nebula. Oh, wow. 2392, so, isn't it? 2392? Yeah, 2392. Lion Nebula, which is an asterism. And then we have Leo, the constellation, which is the other lion. Hey, yes. Tim? Yes. What, yeah. what star, Tim, but this what isn't an asterism, that? Ron. This is a planetary nebula. Right. Oh, it Tim, is, what, what, what star is that nearest? Oh, I want to, <laughs> yeah. I want to hear you say it. I, I always tell people, you know, you look at the, you look at the, uh, you know, Castor and Pollux and you explain right. to them where the heads is and where the feet is. And in between, there's that little star there called Wasap. And I always mm -hmm. refer to that beer commercial where the guy goes, Wasap. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's, there's that's, that's 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 Wasap. 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 <laughs> and then, so you always kind of, you, when you do a little hop on that, you find Wasap and then you kind of go towards the head in a diagonal. It, it's kind of hard to find, but but uh, that's that's the easiest heart star hop for that one. So anyway, on the twelfth of October, which is coming up, this is the night Thursday, 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 and that might be Universal time, so it might end up being Wednesday night for us. Could be, but anyway, the comet will be um, right in this within a field of view of the Eskimo Nebula. Oh wow! And the chart nice. that didn't get shown here. Uh, it shows the path going right over the nebula, but I'm sure it doesn't get, oh, get that accurate. Hmm. Photo op. Yes, it will be a great photo. Oh, that'd be great. Another photo op that actually is even good tonight is Comet Pons Brooks uh, is up near Hercules, so a little bit low in the West, mm -hmm. but still pretty high. And it's undergoing another outburst, and it's at like magnitude 10. And um, just like the last outburst it did a couple of months ago, it's uh, asymmetrical or, or weirdly symmetrical in that it looks like 
um, the Millennium Falcon. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. And or maybe one of those Star Trek spacecraft that's the disc with the two pods. Mm -hmm. um, so so that's another photo op. <laughs> so this this is high um, about three a.m. on tomorrow mm -hmm. or tonight doesn't matter. Well, there's got to be a history story behind that Eskimo nebula. Where the hell did that come from? It was well, oh, if you well. See, if you see the image, you'll know why. See, yeah. That's the that's the nebula. Yeah, yeah, and that's he's got his parka with the oh. fur lining, and then oh, that's okay. the face in the middle. See it? Okay. Yeah. And then, and also course, down here is the word clown face nebula, but now it's called the lion nebula. So apparently yeah. it's got its main. I still call it the Eskimo, but I know it's not politically correct. But I still I'm stuck <laughs> on that. I'm stuck. It on really that. looks like a clown face in the middle, big yeah. red nose. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not a planetary nebula. Yes, it is. It is a planetary. Yeah. Okay. And there's the white dwarf that did all this. Yeah, right there. Right there. Right there. Okay, got it. <laughs> Far out, as we used to say. By the way, can we see that white dwarf in our scopes? Depends what magnitude it is. And I don't know, so I can't it's, answer. It, it's tough. Yeah. I, I, you know, I just... I'll, I'll look but I, i've never seen that i don't think and of course with the filters and things we use it tends to look much more greenish than that yeah it, it, uh, much greener now the the center star of um m57 the ring nebula is around 14 to 14 and a half magnitude so you need to have scopes up in the 12 and a half 14 16 inch range to even have a hope of seeing it yeah vertical and it's under dark sky conditions yeah and i'm sure that most other white dwarfs are probably about the same charles can probably see that i can't hmm. there is a guy that wrote um has published i think two books one for the northern sky and one for the southern sky that records the visual appearance of all the planetary nebulas hundreds and hundreds that he could he he observed and um, Kent Wallace, he used to be a member of the um, Central Coast Astronomical Society based in San Luis Obispo. Wouldn't make a good speaker, or is he not alive? Um, I don't know. I've never heard him speak. We can look him up and see. I wonder if that's the guy I met at Lake San Antonio once who was an expert on, on planetaries. Quite likely. And it, he was he, he was a frequent attender at uh, Calstar. Yeah, because somebody took me over to him because I was asking a question about the blinking planetary and asking if other uh, ne any planetary nebulas had the same characteristics. And he just said, come on up the ladder. And he, he was showing me all kinds of them. Yeah. So uh, but he was known up there. They said, this guy's the best on planetary. Now, I bet it was. I bet it was, yeah. Jerry. I bet it was that guy. That's it. Yeah, I'm sure it was. Yeah. Well, now you touched on Comet Hartley two moments ago. Do you, do you get any pictures of it? It's no, I didn't. I didn't uh, okay. display any pictures. Okay. Well, it's reaching. What is it heading toward the sun? And is that perihelion? Um. Yes. Okay, but that's not what this picture is all about, is it? No, this is the Saturn. So we've moved on to another um, ghost planetary nebula, which is um, a the um, edit one of the contributors to Astronomy Magazine is Stephen James O'Meara, and uh, he has a short list of what he calls Halloween objects that is, ghost nebula or ghost things. And one of them is the Saturn Nebula, which is referred to as the ghost of Saturn. And up yeah. there, that's also the ghost of Jupiter, so that's mm -hmm. that's oh. that's the one that's more traditionally called a ghost, okay. So this is in Capricorn, and this is about nine o'clock in the evening. So it's well placed for us. And uh, this is the planetary nebula, which in a small scope looks like a faint fuzzy Saturn. This is a Hubble oh. picture, so. This is what? This looks like a Hubble picture, though. Yeah, this is more than you'll see in your scope. There's the white dwarf in the middle. 
and these things apparently it was spinning or something and it blew out mostly along its rotational axis equator well are they does it ever come close to saturn the planet no. No. it's no. well it's a long it's close to the ecliptic so saturn could occasionally be in that part of the sky but they aren't now because of no. halloween or october or anything or no 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 all right well, I was in aquarius okay interesting saturn is in aquarius right now but it's over in the water pouring type region i think um rather than the body which is where this is that's certainly a warped ring we're looking at fascinating i don't think i've ever i don't think i've ever got, uh, tried for this i'm gonna have to do it yeah this is, eight, this is eighth magnitude so um now when you get the magnitude brightness of a of a nebula even even a small planetary nebula that's eighth magnitude light spread out over several minutes of an arc so it will be fainter than an eighth magnitude star okay, but, okay. Tim, you should try your different filters on this because yeah it should come out well yeah it's well, the, fairly... the CLS is pretty cool yeah <laughs> the psychedelic hmm. filter but it's always been there and it's the first time i've heard of it ghost of saturn and the guy at astronomy it's, magazine. it's usually just called the saturn nebula yeah okay there really isn't any reason that a star couldn't have a ring like Saturn. In fact, uh, our star does. It's called the asteroid belt in a way, wouldn't you think? Yeah. You just our star's over. ring is called the ecliptic. Yeah. And, Ooh. and you know, it, it, a ring like Saturn's of very fine particles wouldn't last around a star because you have a wind coming out of the star that tends to blow right. the particles away. Oh, yeah. We do see some dust in a ring with the... Uh, what is that? Um, the zodiacal light. Yes, that's it. Thanks. So anyway, Thank moving on to our last topic for today. Psyche. Um, no, we're we're about to launch the Psyche mission to the asteroid Psyche. It's a 2.2 billion mile journey, and it just began this last weekend. No, it's it's Psyche. beginning on Friday. They, they postponed it? No. <laughs> it began its journey as Psyche leaves the Astrotech clean room. And is ah, transported ah. to the uh, SpaceX LC 39A launch facility for launch on a Falcon Heavy. That uh, will be this Thursday, October 12. It will launch. Yeah. And it will go October 2023. 20, um, it will be launched on this orbit, which goes out past Mars, Mars swings in, gets a speed pickup from Mars which puts it on this bigger orbit, and then it approaches and um, arrives at Psyche. It's going to orbit Psyche, and it's not going to land on it. And then it's going to head back. Oh, it's going to keep going on the orbiting Psyche. They have no plans that I know of to land on the thing, but it's going to do spectroscopic studies. Huh. Now, this is a picture, an artist rendition of the Psyche spacecraft at the asteroid Psyche. And the idea, the most interesting thing about this is it's a special kind of asteroid. It's definitely not a rubble pile. At least we don't think it is. Um, but there are six points that NASA has made about this in the article that I um, quoted here is the purpose is to learn more about the asteroid itself, because um, Psyche is thought to, to be, it's hypothesized to be the core of a planetesimal. That is a small planet that formed. It, it, when it formed, it, it compressed and it heated. And then it went through the differentiation phase where um, very heavy elements sank to the middle and lighter elements went out to the crust of it, just like the Earth has, and same thing. And then it got hit by another planetesimal and the crust was blown away or leaving just the core of the, um, the asteroid. So it's apparently a metal rich core. And so that, that we want to verify that that's true. And there have been some recent spectroscopic claims saying, well, it doesn't look as metal as they first thought, but yeah. like the mission will determine that for sure. Right. Can you bring uh, it 
Can you bring up the picture of it again? Looks like the Death Star in the Star Wars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the crater on it. No huh? idea what the actual surface looks like. This is this is totally imagination. Oh, oh, they don't. Other know than the fact know. that it's probably roughly round. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the huge solar panels you need at that distance from the sun. But it's different from the last one that we got material back from Bennu. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that was the carbonaceous one. Interesting. So here are the reasons why we're So going. the surface of Psyche from spectroscopic analysis does not con co appear to contain oxides <clears throat> like Mars surface and the Earth's crust are. It's mostly metals. So oxygen was never there to make yeah. rust. Well, oxygen was there. It was it formed a crust when the planetaris, planetesimal differentiated and it got smashed away. The um, it has a number of science instruments, uh, magnetometer, gamma ray, and neutron spectrometer, multispectral imager, and to do gravity science by measuring precisely the orbit of Psyche as it goes around the planetesimal at different distances. So that's going to give us a look at the inside. One of the key features of this mission will it will use an efficient propulsion system. It will use an ion drive, which, if you remember Star Trek, they're always following people by following their ion trail. So um, the the key thing about ion engines are let's see where's the image they have that they exert the same amount of force that you would feel holding three quarters in the palm of your hand. That doesn't weigh a lot. Yes, that's the force the engine would push on the satellite but it pushes on it all the time. So it, it's not a burst of high energy at first. And then the planet, the ant thing coasts. It's this small um, force that's most of the trip. So it can attain very high speeds and it's very efficient to contain it, hmm. to attain it. You would think if they're spending that kind of money, they'd do a grand tour of the asteroid belt and just go one right after another since we're not getting anything back and we're spending that kind of money like Voyager did, you know? Yeah, well, New, Hor you New Horizons did that. It went by Pluto and now we redirected it to another one. I yeah. don't see why they couldn't do it here. Yeah, there's no, there's nobody saying it can't have a future part of its mission where it continues on, but it may not have enough fuel you know, right. it's a balance between how much weight you allocate to the fuel and how much to instruments. It might not have enough fuel to exit orbit and go very far. Mm -hmm. But certainly it's got a camera and all the sensors. Yeah. To send back pictures and data. Multispectral imager. Fascinating. But that's going to take a few years, right? This one's going to go. Yeah, what? I think it's going to get there in what, 2029? Yeah. So that's, that's, what, that's what the image said, yeah. We may not be here then. You never know the way things are yeah, going. Yeah. Jerry, how, how 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 much time does it take these ion drives to, you know, come up to speed that they want? I mean, is it? it it's very gradual, right? That it's a continual acceleration. Yes. Yeah. And then when you want to slow down at the other end, you have to decelerate for almost as long. Right. Huh. Huh. I don't think SpaceX goes on ion engines. Don't do they? They're regular. No, 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 no it uses no. chemical rockets. The, the satellite has nothing to do with SpaceX. SpaceX is just the booster that's launching it. Yeah. But theoretically, and, you could reach half the speed of light with these things. You could reach the speed of light almost. Yeah. yeah 0. 0.999 if you do it if long you, enough. If you had enough fuel. Yeah. Well, so, NASA gotta, wants everybody to get involved on this. So there's a number of websites here. You can find, look at this chart on YouTube and look to go to these different um, sites and get involved in, I don't know exactly what, but uh, there's a lot of visualization tools of what's going on. Well, with that it's name, a, Psyche, in this day and age, with all these mental problems everybody's having since they went through the pandemic, wow, what an hour plus. We went over, but that's okay. We have control over this. Gentlemen, we'll probably see most of you on screen. Tim, you're invited to join us. On Thank Saturday, you. At five o'clock, I guess, right? We'll have our board meeting back here again Monday morning and uh, take care of your wives. I'm glad everybody's healthy. It was a great show. I learned a lot. Can't and Saturday to... morning, we will be at the... Um, oh, that's right. Camino Real Marketplace. Yeah, Camino Real Marketplace. Why do I blank on that name? I spent so much time out. there. 
figure out a way not to look directly at the sun, but see yeah. part of it. Eight over. to 10 a.m. looking at the solar partial solar eclipse. Three yeah. things hopefully, happen. Hopefully there's no fog. Three yeah. outreach in one day. We're going to be tired that night if you do all Wait, three. there's only two outreaches on that day. Well, don't we have a meeting? And then an, we're not yeah, a meeting is not an outreach. Planning meeting isn't an outreach. <laughs> oh, it's not an outreach. Yeah, it is for me. Pizza. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a reach in with the pizza. All right, everybody, go on SBA.org. Join us. We'll see you next.